Well, good morning, Grace Church. Hey, it's the best day of the week, so let's stand together as we sing, as we lift our voices to our King. Come on.
this is our response. I give my whole life to honor this love by the Lamb who was slain. I'm forgiven, the sinner Savior, crown him forever for the says this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now there, there are seasons of my life where I have read that verse and I've received it with great joy. I delight easily in this truth that God is for me, that he loves me, that I know who I am and I know whose I am. And then there are seasons of my life where the enemy creeps in with this subtle lie. Did God really say that? Did he really say that his love is not far from me when I wander? Did he really say that his love is not far from me when I doubt him? Did he really say that his love is not far from me when I feel unloved by those that bear his image? And the answer that Paul gives us is a resounding, yes, he does. He says this, for I am sure, I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you take this truth today, you hold it closely, you hold it firmly in those seasons of doubt, in those seasons of feeling unloved, in those seasons of wandering, you believe what he says. Let's sing this. Give me eyes to see more of who you are may what i behold still my anxious heart take what i have known and break it all apart for you my god are crazy
Jesus, we see you clearly. We see you in your glory and your splendor. And even in that, we see you as friend. You love us, how you love us. My mind cannot comprehend such a love. But Lord, we choose to trust it. We choose to believe that because you are good, you love us. And that we are reconciled by the blood of your cross. Jesus, heal broken hearts and lives. You are on display. All of this is for you and you are supremely worthy of it. We pray this in your name, amen. Amen, you can be seated. Anger has been a part of my life, all my life. It was so fast, it was scary. Um, I would even scare myself at times. And that's not a joke. And uh, I would do things like, uh, I would verbally abuse people for loud phone talkers, rude behavior. Oh, I'd chase cars down, dare them to pull over. It leaves a kind of a shameful thing in you. When, why did I do that? Man, 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 how can I even be a Christian? How can I be saved? I believed a lot of lies about myself that Satan kept throwing at me. It was like it was in a, a tape in my head, a looping tape. You're worthless, you have no value, you know. You're less than everybody, you're slow, dumb, stupid. List goes on. But how it relates to anger is that I could never change. I was a mess. I started reading the Bible. I knew I needed something. And it started sinking in a little bit, you know, some of the words. And it was starting to have an effect on me, in my heart. Big time. <laughs> so, but I kept with that. And uh, my thinking changed on a lot of things. My behavior started changing. There's one scripture that really helps me. It's 1 John 3, 20. For though our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and He knows everything. And when I think of that verse, I think of He knows my sin and everything. It just kind of frees me up inside and helps me to go on. Yeah, amen. Amen. It's a great word. Listen, thank you for joining us today here at EP, uh, the Chapel, Chaska, Pocatello, and online. Well, as you uh, noted there, we are going to, over the next three weeks or so, do kind of a, like a short standalone series on what I think are kind of three big time issues kind of plaguing people inside of the church and outside of the church. Anger, anxiety, and addiction. Anger today, we'll talk about anxiety next week and then addiction uh, two weeks out. And then on September the 22nd, I'm going to jump into a book series through the Old Testament book of Daniel, right? So Daniel and Revelation kind of go hand in hand. Amen. It'll be super timely for us. No doubt about that. Now, some of you know, many of you know that in my previous life, I worked as a probation officer in Hamilton County, Indiana, just north of Indianapolis. And I supervised 125 adult felony offenders. So once someone gets arrested at the felony level, they either go to prison or end up on probation. And I supervise people who are on probation. And I will never ever forget the first time that I had an actual literal face-to-face -face conversation with a man who committed murder. His name was George Hardeback. And as I sat with him in a tiny small prison cell, George recounted for me how he brutally gunned down five members of his family, his mother and his father, and then three of his five siblings. And, and, and I, was, I was knocked sideways as he kind of casually and calmly described the heinous details of, of his crime. Honestly, it was kind of an out-of-body experience for me. I, I just couldn't register the words that he was saying. And we know, right, murder is a, is a fatal attack on a human being. 
stamped with the image of God. It is also a violation of the sixth commandment. And, and no doubt, right, all of us here today are in 100% agreement that murder is treacherously evil and unlawful and warrants severe punishment. And so when Jesus says what he says in Matthew 5, 21, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Everyone then, everyone then and everyone now nods in complete affirmation. Murder is easy to denounce. But where Jesus goes next may be a, a little surprising. Look at what he says in Matthew 5, 22. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. I'll explain that in a moment. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire, in danger of the hell of fire. So, so what is this all about? Well, the Old Testament law primarily dealt with outward actions, not inward attitudes. Thus, one way that Jesus fulfilled the law, the Old Testament law, was by amplifying it and by intensifying it, meaning Jesus not only addressed the behavior of a person, but also the heart that churns out or cranks out that behavior. Well, not so with the scribes and Pharisees and religious leaders of the day. They majored on the externals, but not the internal mechanics or dynamics that led up to, in this case, murder. But Jesus knows that's not good enough because it doesn't cut deeply enough. Jesus denounces murder, of course, but also gets to the heart of the matter by addressing the hate and the sinful anger that resides in our hearts. And Jesus says that sinful anger is an anger that refuses to be managed. It is a, an anger that refuses to be managed. Look at what he says, 22. But I tell you that anyone who is angry, and he uses a really unique word for that word anger here in verse 22. The anger he is describing here is a perpetual, ongoing, continual, out of control anger. This is the brooding, simmering anger that is nurtured and fueled and not kept in, in check. Now Jesus isn't referring to a single moment of anger. It's not translated everyone who gets angry. It says everyone who, who is angry. There is an isness to this. This is a volatile anger, a carried anger, a continued anger. It is a, a portable anger that you pack up and take with you wherever you go. It is a decided and decisive way to live life. It's the type of anger that savors revenge and resentment and refuses reconciliation. Interestingly, the, other, the only other Greek word for anger in the New Testament is the Greek word thymos. Thymos is anger like the flame which comes from dried straw. It quickly blazes up and quickly dies down. That is not the type of anger that Jesus is referring to here. Moreover, let me be clear in saying Jesus is not communicating to us here that we can't be angry because we know that anger in and of itself is not a sin. Paul said, right, be angry and, and do not sin. So it is possible to be angry and still be godly. Jesus is essentially only prohibiting the kind of anger that is purposeful and or unwilling to be restrained or Contained. He's addressing the person who's kind of made the conscious decision to nurse their anger, to feed their anger, to hold on to their anger, to embrace their anger, and to use their anger against people. So I'll put this on the screen so you kind of have an idea here. Regarding anger, we aren't talking about a short-lived reaction, thymos, but rather a long-term disposition. 
You are choosing to be an angry person. Thus, Jesus would say then that sinful anger is an anger that refuses to be managed. It is an anger that refuses to be controlled or restrained. Secondly, Jesus says that sinful anger is an anger that results in derogatory or demeaning insults. And as I was thinking about this, I thought of the seven deadly sins, right, in Proverbs. And I thought, you know, if pride is the most subtle of the seven deadly sins, then anger is the most obvious of those seven. Like, like lust and envy and greed can be like harbored internally in our hearts, but not anger. You can't hide anger. Anger shows up in a screaming voice, harsh words, a scowl, a punch, or even, even by ignoring someone. Anger often hurts others before it hurts us. And so knowing this, Jesus kind of turns up the heat, if you will. Look what he says in verse 22. But I say to you, everyone who is angry has made a decision to live this angry lifestyle with his brother will be liable to judgment. And then the sinful anger then comes out of our mouths. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. I'll explain that. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the fire of hell, in danger of the fire of hell. So in the New Testament, there was a, a, a group of religious leaders called the Sanhedrin, and they essentially functioned like a, a religious supreme court of their day. They tried the most serious offenses and pronounced the severest penalties, including death by stoning. And, and Jesus says that this council, the Sanhedrin, will intervene if someone verbally demeans and or insults his brother. But then Jesus takes it a step further. He says, anyone who declares you fool will be liable to the fire of hell. The Greek word for fool here is the word moros, it's where we get our English word moron, meaning idiot, moron. And the whole idea then is that to call someone a fool or a moron accuses them of both being stupid and godless. It questioned a person's mental and moral competence. It undermined their humanity. I mean, we could broaden it out to say, if you use language, or you name call in a way that dehumanizes people, that's exactly what Jesus is talking about. So we have to think that every single human being has been stamped with the, the image of God. and God loves and cares for all of humanity. And so Jesus says to insult a person gives hateful expression to the ungodly anger in the heart. And to condemn a person's character by calling him a fool or a moron gives hateful expression to that ungodly, sinful anger too. The deeper reality then that Jesus is hitting at here is that one kind of hatred can lead to insults, but another kind of hatred can go rogue and it can actually lead to, to murder. It all begins in the heart. It's an attitude of the heart. And it is this attitude that makes a person morally guilty before God. And then Jesus says that unrepentant hatred and anger that is verbally vented towards people is actually a hell-deserving crime or the danger of a hell-deserving crime. Hell in this instance is Gehenna. Gehenna is a, a deep, narrow ravine south of Jerusalem. Uh, it's the valley where all of the filth, the dead animals and the trash were cast out and burned like a, like a perpetual ongoing fire. And so I, I think Jesus's larger point is this. If you are, if you're tempted to, to not repent of the hate in your heart or not get it in check, and all of that hatred then begins to manifest itself in sinful anger, you should seriously reconsider because there's way more on the line than you know. There are serious consequences is what Jesus tells us here to, to let that hatred just lurk in your heart 
and then to be verbally vented via sinful anger to other human beings. So like Jesus really cranks up the heat on us here. Why? Because he wants to drill down into our hearts that lead to our behavior. So, so what then is God saying to us? How should we think about this today? Well, I think he's saying to us today, first, that, that getting angry is okay. Getting angry is okay. Staying angry is not. So Jesus isn't saying, do not get angry forever. He is saying, do not stay angry forever. You know, of all the seven deadly sins, anger may be the most tricky to understand and, and to, to deal with, right? While the other seven deadly sins must be overcome, anger has to be managed, right? We don't talk about managing lust or greed or, or gluttony. We want to get rid of them. We want to expunge them from our lives. But we can't expunge Anger. Anger is like an aspect of our humanity. It's a part of our nature that we have to learn how to express then in godly, Christ honoring ways. So make sure you understand no one is here today saying, hide your anger, bury your anger, stuff your anger, never get angry. That is not the message at all. Our emotions are meant to be expressed in healthy, God-honoring ways. So I'll put this on the screen so you can see this. So, so Paul kind of jumps in and has a, a little teaching section on this too in Ephesians 4. And, and Ephesians 4 kind of confirms this with a, what I call a few caveats, okay? So Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says this, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So you can be angry, not sin, right? So number one, Paul acknowledges it's okay to be angry. It is okay to be angry. Anger can be a right and just response. Uh, your anger can also be what? A, a righteous or healthy emotion. Secondly, Paul says you can be angry and still be godly. So let that anger that is in you produce justice, not lead you into, into sinfulness. And then number three, Paul says, don't let anger linger. Don't let anger linger. Why? Don't, and he tells us, right? He gives us a couple issues here to contend with. Don't go to bed angry. Uh, don't let things fester. And here's how I think about it, right? Don't give anger space to roam in your head, in your heart, or in your home. And here's why. Anger always picks up a head of steam and grabs friends along the way, right? It, it grabs friends along the way. Anger grows into, into rage. It grows into revenge. It grows into bitterness. It grows into unforgiveness. And you don't then want to give the devil an opportunity to pounce and spread destruction in your heart or in your home. Does that make sense? So you can be angry and not sin. Then he says what? Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Deal with that. Don't let anger linger. Why? Because you don't want to give the devil like a playground to create a playground of activity for the enemy in your home because of unresolved anger in your heart or in the relationships within your home. Now, we all know that this, this upcoming election cycle is going to elicit a ton of emotional energy from people. I'm already getting emails. I'm like, it's August, man, it's August. But I know people are, are intense, right? And, and I'll say this. There are a lot of legitimate things in culture to be angry about. You, you should be, you can be, you're allowed to be angry at the anti-Semitism that is sweeping the globe. You should be angry at what our universities have devolved into. 
Uh, you could be angry that children and parents are being duped into believing that gender is fluid and subsequent surgeries are actually helpful. You can be angry that men and women are hurting actual women in the trans movement. You should be and can be angry that the taking of life via abortion has been packaged as some sort of liberation for women, as some sense of noble civil rights, rather than the anti-life ideology that it is. Those are some things I get culturally that we could and should be angry about. I look around politically and I look at the insanity politically and I'm like, wow, it does generate a lot of stuff inside of me. And so be angry at the craziness of our politics, but don't be an angry person. Don't name call, don't be violent, don't be vulgar, don't be a cowardly keyboard sniper, don't be a joyless ogre. Be angry and don't sin. Be angry and don't sin by letting your heart be filled with rage and hatred and sinful anger for the next four months. I say it like this, take your position but do it with a godly disposition. Amen? Take your position. Do you. Take your position, but do it with a godly disposition. I like to think of like what I do in these terms. I like to consider myself as fiery glad, not fiery mad. A lot of passion, a lot of energy. Believe what I'm doing up here. But fiery glad is really different than fiery mad. Amen? Take your position, but do it with a godly disposition. Uh, two, what else is God saying to us today? Uh, I think he's saying to us that getting a grip on your heart is the only way to get a grip on your anger. So we're not talking about verbal reformation. We're talking about heart transformation. C.S. Lewis said this, and it is a great thought here. He says this, what really matters are those little marks or twists on the central inside part of the soul, which are going to turn us in the long run into a heavenly or a hellish creature, meaning who we are on the inner man or inner woman is of utmost importance to Jesus. It's why Jesus always takes aim at the heart. It's why the Bible says that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, so maybe what you need to do is this. Pretty straightforward, right? Uh, ask the Lord Jesus to perform like radical surgery on that hateful side in your heart. Radical surgery regarding the sinful anger you've been like verbally venting towards other people. Like check yourself, let the Lord Jesus Christ know, hey, I'm open to whatever you wanna do, however you wanna work in my heart, I'm open to this. I realize how serious this actually is. Thirdly, what else is God saying to us there? I think he says to us, right, all throughout scripture with regard to anger, that we should become angry, Slowly, become angry slowly. Now we know that anger can be a valid response to something that is wrong or unjust. And it's okay to be angry. But don't explode, don't go off, don't lose it or have a hair trigger Temper, exercise internal patience. James 1.19 says it like this. Be quick to hear, especially the word. 
slow to speak, and then what? Slow to become angry. You read throughout the Proverbs. Proverbs says a lot to say about anger. One of the unique principles that I kind of pulled out is this. When patience runs out, anger runs in. Isn't that true? When patience runs out, anger runs right in. And so what are we doing? We're trying to exercise internal patience. A Proverbs 16, 32 says this, whoever is slow to anger, like here's an encouraging reason to be slow to anger. Whoever's slow to anger is better than the mighty and he who rules his spirit than he who takes the city. Meaning there is power, right, and strength in ruling your emotions and in exercising the fruit of the spirit, right, in self-control. One commentator said, I'll put it on the screen for you here. It's a good thought. Self-discipline that puts a lid on anger controls passions, appetites, and temper is a greater advantage than being a renowned warrior. That's exactly what Proverbs 16, 32 is referring to. Here's another good strategy to employ in that regard. Psalm 4, 4. I love this. Look at what it says. Be angry and what? Do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds, and what? Be silent, be silent. Meaning, be angry in a godly way. Be angry in a godly way. Don't, don't blurt out a thoughtless response. Ponder in your own heart. Head to your bed, sit on your bed, ponder in your own hearts, on your bed, Meaning what? Be silent for a while. Like calm down. Exercise internal patience before you speak. Now, I, I think I shared this with you a, a few years ago. But when our, when our kids were little, Delaney, Marlon, and Drake, when they, were, when they were little, Sherry, my wife, actually turned Psalm 4-4 into, into a song. And I'm going to put the song up on the screen here. When you are, she, and she put like this, this whole thing together with it. When you are so mad, I don't know why it's so mad at your dad, but any, anyway, so anyway. So there it is. And so I've asked Sherry, it's her song. She's here. So I asked her to come up here and, and do the song. And let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Before, don't, wait, wait, before, let me, listen. Number one, come on up here. Number one, uh, you want to get the word of God in your kids. Right? You want them to know the word and embrace the word and live the word. And so here's what she did. So moms and grandmas, write her down, all right? So show them how you, show them how you need the words back. Okay, there you go. Put some sauce into it. Oh, here we go. So with the kids, it was when you are so mad, so mad at your dad and you're feeling really, really sad, then go into your room before your mouth goes boom and you start feeling that gloomy doom and sit on your bed while thinking in your head about the very words that you have read and be silent. There it is. There it is. There it is. Yes. But I was reading that, you know, so I was, so I was kind of prepping this week and I'm like, what was that song that you used to do? And she remembered it like, of course. When you are so mad, so mad at your dad. I'm like, why am I the focal point of, the, of our children's angst and anger? So I decided that I would pull one together myself. <laughs> when you are so mad, so mad at your mom, and you're losing, losing, your sense of calm. Find a quiet place where you can slow your pace and let your mind seek God's grace. Rest on your bed. Let go of what was said and trust that God will guide your big head and then be still. So you can use both of those, both of those. So it was really funny. So Sherry's like, why do you want me to come up here and do that? I'm like, because I'm going to surprise you and I'm going to, yeah, that. But listen, understand. I know, I know, yeah, yes. 
Understand that anger, understand that anger either reveals something is wrong or reveals something's wrong in you. You have to discern your anger. You can be angry and not sin. So you gotta go, okay, why am, why am I angry? Is it because something's really wrong or is it because like something's really wrong in me? So discern your anger. Why am I angry? And then you're doing what? Am I sinning in my anger? Uh, it, may, it may be this. Some of you need to repent and apologize for your unrighteous anger at home with your kids, um, with your spouse. And I'll, I'll tell you, you, you want to model behavior in your home that your kids pick up on, then moms and dads need to apologize. And kids pick up on it, they see it, and you want them to see that right in your home. No home is perfect, we're all trying to pursue Christ. But when we say we're sorry, it demonstrates godliness and, and humility. Uh, I would also say this, because I see a, a lot of guys do this. Understand that the, uh, the silent treatment or in using the silent treatment, you're actually punishing your spouse in a way that actually feels like a loud scream even though you're not saying anything. And so that whole silent treatment thing, ignoring, cold shoulder thing, you need to repent of that too. I need to repent of that too. So we need to apologize. And you know this, the secret sauce to all of this, to apologize, to have a heart to apologize, it's just, it's humility. It's, it's humility. Uh, and you want more grace in your life, and we all do. God opposes the proud, but what does he do? He gives grace to humble people. And I want more grace, and I'm gonna tell you, humility is a lightning rod for God's grace. His grace is attracted to humility. Uh, so hopefully we see that today. Uh, you young couples, uh, never go to bed mad. Stay up and fight. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Stay up and fight it out. Uh, never go to bed mad. Uh, and I'll just say this, and I, and I hope you'll do this for you young couples, right? Uh, don't let going to bed angry become a habit in your home. Don't open the door to that in your home. I'm telling you, Anger grows, it roams, it moves from our heart to our head to our mouths. Uh, anger then gets a bunch of buddies, brings them rage and bitterness and unforgiveness into our homes. And before you know it, if you'd have just said you were sorry and humbled yourself the night before, it would have gone away. Now you get a whole thing on your hands that you have to contend with. So what, what's, what's the point, right? Keep short accounts. So if something's off in your home, resolve it that day, that day. Don't, don't let going to bed angry become like a habit that you start allowing to take root in your home. And then ultimately, as I thought about this, the James 1, 19 and 20, I thought, isn't this interesting? James says, know this, my beloved brothers, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. That's in the context of hearing the Bible, by the way. Uh, so when the word of God is, is preached, don't, don't talk too much, Just listen to it. Don't get angry at what the word says, do what the word says. And don't get, you know, where you're trying to like compete with what God's been telling you. And here's why, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That's the greatest reason of all, isn't it? For the anger of man, human anger, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. By the way, I will say this and I'll end with this. Uh, you can be angry and you can hate certain things. You can hate evil. You can be angry about evil and you should also hate and be angry over your own sin. And let that drive you to repentance, right? And you trust in Jesus Christ, be filled with the Holy Spirit so that the fruit of the Spirit takes root in your life and controls who you are. Uh, 
I was told one time that a temper is a good thing to have so long as you don't lose it, right? So you, you control your anger. Don't let your anger control you. No one's saying don't be angry. Just don't be angry where it leads you into sin and keep short accounts in your home and become angry slowly, slowly, right? And I hope all of us will take our positions but we'll do so with godly dispositions. Amen? So God, we pray, Lord, that you would do a work in us, transform us, change us, help us to be humble people today. Help us to say we're sorry to our husbands, our wives, to our children, to our friends. We pray for reconciliation and restoration to take place in marriages today, between moms and dads today, between moms and daughters and fathers and sons. Man, you would clean house in a good way, Lord. You clean up our house by dealing with the issues of our heart. Help us to be discerning of our anger. Help us to be angry and not sin because we know that human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires, and we want to do what God desires. So use us today, oh God, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Would you stand? Let's continue together this morning.
Troy, thanks for that powerful word this morning, right? Anger means that either something is wrong or something is wrong in me. And you heard Jim's testimony at the start of our service. And I got to watch Jim firsthand work through a struggle with anger as I walked through my own struggle with anger together in a ministry called Regeneration. And we're launching Regeneration here at Grace Church in just a few weeks. So whether or not your struggle is, is anger or anxiety or addiction or something else, my challenge to you is maybe twofold. One, I want you to know that change is possible in Christ Jesus. And I want you to know too that that freedom is only found in, in Him. And so Regen is, is a way, it's based on 12 biblical steps to freedom and it's a, a way to pursue healing from that struggle, that brokenness that we all feel. So if, if you walked in here with a struggle and you're ready to be free from it, my encouragement, go visit us at the Regen booth out at the ministry fair today. As you leave the service, all the ministries from Grace Church are represented out there. Men's, women's, Regen, kids ministries, got a ton of fun stuff going on. The students team and I will be out over this way. Come find how you can get you and your family connected here at Grace Church this fall. And as always, if you came prepared to worship God through your giving this morning, you can do that in any of our three normal ways. You can give on the Grace Church website, through the Grace Church app, or at any of the giving stations as we exit the building. So let's close our service in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us another opportunity to gather together corporately and to worship you. God, thank you that you are a God who breaks chains and that whatever our struggle is, freedom is possible and freedom is found in you, Jesus. So God, for those of us who are struggling with anger this morning, would you give us grace? Would you free us, God? We love you, Jesus. Thank you for your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. Have a great Sunday.